So, uh, how many likes it getting dark at around 5 o'clock? Don't you just love it? No! No! Who likes that? No, I, I don't like it getting dark that early, you know? And, and then when it comes around 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, I look over at Pam and I'm like, man, it feels like it's 10 o'clock midnight. She's like, I know. It's like, all I want to do is go to bed, you know? It's horrible. But that's, that's, the, that's the season. The day grows shorter in the wintertime. And one thing, one advantage, though, of the darkness of, of the hour and the darkness of the day during the winter season is that usually it's supplemented with lights. That's how we celebrate. That's part of our celebration is celebrating with lights. And it makes things more festive and it makes us feel better. And this ancient tradition goes all the way back uh, people started lighting candles and putting candles in their uh, doorways and in their windows. And, and you started seeing bonfires everywhere and lights in the streets because it was it was kind of the society's way of saying, you know what? We, we know this is temporal. We know that this darkness isn't going to last forever. And we are we are longing for the day when the days are longer again, when that, that light comes back during the springtime and in the summer. So it's just kind of a hearkening and a calling to bring back those lighter days. But the advantage of things being dark is that you can see the light clearer. You can see the light better. If I had a flashlight and I just turned it on, you'd be able to see it, but it wouldn't be that spectacular because, you know, our sanctuary is full of light. We've got the, we've got the chandelier lights. We've got the Christmas lights and holiday lights. So it really wouldn't mean anything. But if we were here at midnight and all the lights were off and I shone that flashlight, it would light up the sanctuary. Because it's the only light that's available. So we think of light during this time of year. And we're so grateful and thankful for that light. And we ultimately know that all these physical lights and these electronic lights kind of point to Jesus Christ. Points to Yeshua because he is indeed the light of the world. So uh, I just want to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. This is my uh, ugly Hanukkah sweater. So uh, turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Now, Hanukkah is, a lot of people say it's the Jewish Christmas. And it's not. It has nothing to do with Christmas. Totally different. But, you know, and a lot of people say, well, that's just a Jewish holiday. It really doesn't have anything to do with me as a Gentile believer, as a Gentile Christian. But I beg to differ. Hanukkah is really for everybody who believes in Jesus Christ, and I want to emphasize the importance of Hanukkah for the believer. So, you know, the question has been asked, uh, you know, is Hanukkah even in the New Testament? Is, uh, is Hanukkah in the scriptures anywhere? And if so, what does it really mean, and how does it pertain to believers in Jesus Christ? So we see in John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22, beginning with verse 22, it says, then the festival of dedication. Some translations say the feast of dedication. Now in the tree of life version, which is a messianic version of the scripture, it says then during the feast of Hanukkah. So is Hanukkah in the scriptures? Yes, absolutely it is. We find it here in John chapter 10, verse 22. So it says the festival of dedication or the festival of Hanukkah took place where? In Jerusalem. Jerusalem is ground zero for Hanukkah, and we're going to find out why here in a minute. And it was winter. Well, lo and behold, you look outside, there's snow on the ground. You look out the door, it's chilly, it's cold. It's wintertime here, just like it's winter in Jerusalem right now. So it says the, 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 the feast of Hanukkah took place in Jerusalem, and it was in winter. Verse 23, and Yeshua, Jesus, was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. So we have some very important things right here. We have the Feast of Hanukkah being mentioned, called the Feast of Dedication. It takes place in Jerusalem. That is the ground zero, the central place where Hanukkah was born and Hanukkah took place. And it gives you the season, this season right here, wintertime. And it says Jesus was there. So we see that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Now why would he do a crazy thing like that? Can anybody guess? Because Jesus is Jewish. 
Jesus is a Jew, so Jesus would naturally be celebrating Hanukkah and be a part of this festivities. And as always, with all the other holidays and all the other feasts that are in the Bible, he injects himself in it. He shows where he, uh, where he belongs with the observance of these holidays. And it says, verse 24, the Jews surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus said, I did tell you, and you won't believe me. Jesus answered them, the works that I do in my father's name testify about me. So basically, the proof is in the pudding. If you're not going to believe me, Jesus said, believe the works that I do, because they testify of my father. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. And that's a very poignant statement right there of Jesus because this literally plays out almost every day in Jerusalem. There is a pastor who tells a story that he was visiting Jerusalem and he was at this little cafe on the edge of town and these two shepherds with their flocks came and the flocks mingled. And he's like, oh, oh, we have a problem here. What's going to happen? How is he going to tell the sheep apart easily? Because the sheep are not going to follow the voice of somebody they don't recognize. They only follow the voice of the shepherd. So the, these particular shepherds, their flocks mixed, but there's no problem. As soon as they got to a wider space and were able to separate, they just said, hey, sheep, come here. Hey, sheep, come here. And they both naturally separated. So they knew. So Jesus is saying, you don't follow me because you don't recognize my voice. You're not part of my sheep. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. So Yeshua is making a very poignant declarative statement here that he's saying, me and my father are one. He's saying, I've told you once because in, in, in verse 25, he says, I already told you I was the Messiah, but you didn't believe me. He says, so I'm saying it again. I and my father are one. We are one and the same. And so that, that was blasphemy. You know, it's one thing to claim that you're the Messiah, but to claim that, that, you, that you're one with God himself, that was blasphemy in their ears. So let me read to you a little bit about Hanukkah and where it comes from. Now, in the Catholic Church, they have what's called the apocryphal literature. And part of this apocryphal literature is the books of Maccabees. Now, I know as Protestants, we're a little bit scared and leery about, you know, the, the Apocrypha, but it's nothing to be afraid of. It's just historical documents and books that go right into the narrative of Scripture. As a matter of fact, the first century church, though they may not have believed the Apocrypha to be canon or to be inspired, they still read it within their synagogues and churches because it had a lot to do with the narrative and the history of the canonical Scriptures itself. So in 2 Maccabees, chapter 10, verses 1 through 9, gives us a summary. And it says, Judah Maccabeus and his followers, under the leadership of the Lord, recaptured the temple and the city of Jerusalem. So the, the whole thing behind Hanukkah is that King Antiochus Epiphanes, who was one of the descendants of the leaders of uh, the generals of Alexander the Great, because after Alexander died... He gave his kingdom, he split it up ten ways between his generals. So Antiochus Epiphanes was one of the descendants of these generals. And so he took over Jerusalem and forced all the Jews to behave and act and live like Gentile Syrian Greeks. And a lot of these Jews fell in line with that, so much so that they had a process to reverse the circumcision that, that marked their body. Because, and it was painful. Yeah, it was very painful. And the reason they did this is because whenever they played sports, they played sports in the buff. So it's easy to point out who's a Jew and who's not by who's circumcised. So they wanted to fit in, right? So they reversed the marks of their circumcision. So Judah Maccabee and his followers under the leadership of the Lord recaptured the temple. Which temple? The very temple that we find Jesus walking in in, in John chapter 10. So if it wasn't for the Maccabees, there would be no Hanukkah. If there wasn't any Maccabees, there would be no Jesus walking in, 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 in Solomon's colonnade during the Feast of Dedication. Uh, so it says, they tore down all the altars which the foreigners had set up in the marketplace and destroyed the other places of worship that had been built. 
They purified the temple and built a new altar. Then with new fire started by striking flint, they offered sacrifice for the first time in two years. Burn incense, lit the lamps, and set out the sacred loaves. So we know that, that in the tabernacle and in the temple, they had the, the furnishings, the table of showbread and the altar of incense, and they reestablished all this. And there was the uh, seven-branched menorah, the, the, the light, the, the, the candle albra within the temple. Now, this is not found in, in, in uh, the Apocrypha, but legend has it that when they were cleaning... They could only find one cruise of oils, uh, one cruise of oil that was not contaminated. And a cruise of oil would last a day. And it would it would be, you know, eight days or uh, to, to be able to make more of this oil to keep the lamp burning. So they're thinking to themselves, okay, we've got a dilemma. Everything's purified, everything's clean. Do we light the menorah or don't we? We only got one cruise of oil. If we light it, it's gonna last a day anyway. It's like, heck, let's just light it. See what happens. So they lit the menorah and a miracle occurred where the oil that was only meant to burn and last for a day lasted the whole eight days until they were able to process more olive oil to keep the candle burning, to keep the uh, menorah burning. So it says they purified the temple and built a new altar. Then with new fire started by striking flint, they offered sacrifices for the first time in two years, burnt incense, lit the lamps, and there's where the miracle occurred, and set out the sacred loaves. And they had done all this, and they lay face down on the ground and prayed that the Lord would never again let such a disaster strike them. They begged him to be merciful when he punished them for future sins and not hand them over anymore to barbaric pagan Gentiles. They rededicated, and that word rededicated is Hanukkah. That's where we get the word Hanukkah. In Hebrew, it means dedication. And I'll remember when Ariana was born on December 10th, I felt the Lord say to me, she is a Hanukkah baby. She is a dedicated child to me. She's your firstborn, but she belongs to me. They rededicated the temple on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, that's on the Hebrew calendar, the same day of the same month on which the temple had been desecrated by the Gentiles. So the temple was, was taken over on Kislev 23, or 25, and so it was also rededicated during that time. So it was kind of turning the tables on what the enemy had done. The happy celebration lasted eight days, like the Festival of Shelters otherwise known as Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. So Hanukkah is modeled after the Feast of Tabernacles, modeled after Sukkot. And the people remembered how only a short time before they had spent the festival of shelters wandering like wild animals in the mountains and living in caves, but now carrying green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivy. So we see the greenery just as you know Christmas has greenery. Hanukkah has greenery as well. We see that play a part. They paraded around singing and gratefully praising to him who had brought about the purification of the temple. Everyone agreed that the entire Jewish nation should celebrate this festival each year. So boom, Hanukkah becomes an official Jewish holiday. It's not one of the appointed festivals we find in Leviticus 23, but it's modeled after one of the festivals in Leviticus 23, which is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we see this dedication of the temple happen over and over again through history, and it always took place during the Feast of Tabernacles, during Sukkot. Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 8, dedicated, or hanukkah if you will, the newly built temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. Ezra, in Ezra chapter 6, verses 16 through 17, after returning from Babylonian exile, this would be... Daniel's group, right? Because Daniel was taken off into Babylonian captivity. This would be his group. So after returning from Babylonian exile, they rebuilt the temple and dedicated or hanukkah it during the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Now the Maccabees, which we just read, there's actually four books of Maccabees. Only two are contained in the Apocrypha. Maccabees, you may also hear the Hasmoneans. That's another name that they went by. But the word Maccabee means the hammer, the hammer. So these Levites were a bunch of, you know, tough guys. 
You know, they were soldiers. They were, they were a guerrilla warfare type of soldier. And so when, when Judah and his brothers started fighting against the Greco-Syrians to regain the Temple Mount and to regain the Temple, they struck hard and they were called the Maccabees because they were like the hammer. You know, and sometimes we hear the hammer's coming down. And that represents judgment because a hammer not only smashes things, but it builds things. Also, a hammer is used in judgment. It's the gavel that is, that is struck down to let you know that a sentence has been carried out. So the Maccabees were like the gavel. They were like the hammer. They're also called the Hasmoneans. So they followed suit, uh, just like Solomon and Ezra, but they decided to dedicate it at a different time. Even though that it was usually the dedication of the temple took place uh, uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles, they're like, wait, hang on a second. We just regained the temple. Sukkot is nine months away. We don't want to wait nine months to celebrate the dedication of the temple. We want to do it now because the Lord has given us the victory. So they decided to dedicate the temple, but still maintain the tradition of the Feast of Tabernacle uh, festival. So they celebrated Hanukkah just as they would the Feast of Tabernacles. So um, again, uh, John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. The Feast of Hanukkah took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. So Jesus celebrated Hanukkah because he was a Jew. Now, if you remember what I said, when the Maccabees took over the temple, how many months did I say it was until the Feast of Tabernacles? Nine. Nine months. Wait a second. Who was born on the Feast of Tabernacles? Jesus. So Hanukkah is actually the day that Jesus was conceived. Hanukkah is called the Festival of Lights. Jesus is called the light of the world, and he was conceived on Hanukkah. And then he was born nine months later during the Feast of Tabernacles. How awesome is that? Even though Hanukkah is not a, a, a Leviticus 23 biblical holiday, Jesus still fits into this Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, and in a very poignant way of being conceived during this time. Now, we know how awesome science is and how the scientific advances have, have uh, allowed us to see things we normally wouldn't be able to see. With microscopes and camera technology, we're actually able to put cameras inside the body and, and watch cells divide and watch you know, different miraculous things happen. And they have actually recorded the point of conception. And I was amazed when I found this out. When, when the strongest little spermazoa comes to the egg to fertilize it, and he gets there before every other little spermazoa does, as soon as that spermazoa penetrates the egg, you will not believe what they recorded as happening. A flash of light occurs. And scientists can't explain why this is. Why is there a flash of light once the sperm enters the egg and fertilizes it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. The unformed earth, the watery earth, was like a womb, was like a watery womb. And what did he say? What was the first thing that was created? Let there be light, and there was light. And that was the first point of contact for creation. So it stands to reason when a human being is created that light occurs. So that life begins at the moment of conception. And I think that is just something uh, awesome to, to think about and awesome to behold. Uh, so, as I said, in John chapter 8, verse 12, and in John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus, Yeshua, is called, and he calls himself, the light of the world. And we're here in Hanukkah, which is called the festival of lights. And... Yeshua will be a light in the world to come because in Revelation 21, 23, it talks about how there won't be any need for the sun. There won't even be a need for a temple. It says that Jesus Christ himself will be the light. He will be the light that lights up the new heaven and the new earth. He is the light. And he called himself the light when he walked on earth. So seeing as today's Hanukkah is a kissing cousin to Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, we, you know, we must explore this messianic connection. 
Now, before we get into that, I want to explain something else that's kind of awesome. We just discovered and found out that Hanukkah was the day uh, that Yeshua was conceived. Nine months later, he was born during the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, we know that Jewish people all across the world in synagogues all over the world every Saturday come and meet and read a section and a portion of the five books of Moses. And they make it through the five books of Moses each year. This past week, this past Saturday, one of the chapters that was read was Genesis chapter 38. And that is a very obscure, almost out of place chapter in the Bible because it's right smack dab in the middle of the narrative of the life of Joseph. We see Joseph, his brothers betraying him and selling him into slavery. And boom, we have this story of Judah and Tamar that just seems totally out of place. And then it picks it up back in Genesis 39 with Joseph's life again. But that chapter 38 is pivotal in the history of redemption. Because we know back in Genesis 3.15, that's the first prophecy of the Redeemer, the Messiah coming, that's going to come through the seed of the woman. And I think it's fascinating that it's worded that way. Because women do not have seed. That's even a prophecy of the virgin birth. How can a woman have seed? Man has the seed. Women have the eggs. What's the deal with that? But it says the seed of the woman will overcome the seed of the serpent. And so we see, if, and it's interesting too, that in our Sunday school class, we just got through reading and studying Genesis chapter 39, or chapter 38, I'm sorry. And so we see Judah's depravity and him marrying a Canaanite woman and, and the Messianic seed line being corrupted and polluted. And then God got rid of Onan and Ur. And then Tamar says, you know what? I've got to have children. So she disguises herself as a, as a prostitute. And Judah's so far down in his depravity that he, you know, is intimate with her, thinking she's a prostitute. Three months later, discovers she's pregnant, ready to burn her at the stake until it's proven that Judah is the one that impregnated her. And it was from that incident. It was from Genesis 38 that the official messianic line began. Yeah, it started from Adam to Noah to Shem to Abraham, but it really started with Tamar and Judah because Tamar had twins, had Zerah and Perez, and Perez we find is in the messianic lineage of Messiah. So I just think it's interesting that even though that the Jewish people don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, they read about the beginnings of the Messianic seed line during Hanukkah, during this time of year, the very time and point in history when Jesus was conceived. That is just mind-blowing how God works those things out. So let us turn to a very familiar passage in Luke, Luke chapter 2. So, you know, it's kind of neat that we're that this is the, the week of Hanukkah. We celebrate Jesus's conception. And for the Christian community, you know, here later in the month, they're going to be celebrating or recognizing the birth of Christ uh, through the Christmas celebration. So in Luke chapter two, this is, you know, where most people began reading in regards to the Christmas story, what they call the Christmas story. So in Luke chapter two, we see about the birth of Messiah. But guess what happens? During this time, Yeshua, Jesus, is dedicated at the temple. He's the living manifestation of the temple. There's no need for the temple in the new heaven and the earth because he is the temple. And the physical, fleshly temple of Yeshua is dedicated. He's Hanukkah during the Feast of Tabernacles when he was born. So in Luke chapter 2, it says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while uh, Cyrenius was governor over Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth into Galilee, which is Judea, the city of David, because he's a descendant of David. He's in that Messianic seed line, right? So that's where he had to go to be registered, which is called Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the living bread. So the bread of life, the living bread, was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, because he was of, a, of the house and the lineage of David to be registered along with Mary or Miriam, her name is in Hebrew, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. Scandalous, scandalous. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, laid him in a feeding trough, a place where animals eat grain, and that same kind of grain that the animals eat, you make bread out of. 
these connections are just blowing me away. So it says that he uh, uh, laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So a lot of times you'll see Jesus, uh, the nativity scene, and they're like in this little hut. And they, Jesus was born in a sukkah. He was born in the communal sukkah for the, for the shepherds because the shepherds still had to work during the Feast of Tabernacles, but they still wanted to celebrate it. So they built a little shelter uh, where they were tending the sheep. And on their break times or when they were resting or whatever, they would go in and eat and celebrate and live in that little shelter. And that was the only room that Mary and Joseph had. And so Jesus, who, who, who is, is, is the living word, he's the living temple. He's, he's the bread of life. He was born during the Feast of Tabernacle and was born in a sukkah. How appropriate. He was born in a tabernacle. How appropriate is that? So verse 8 says, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields. And as we learned last year, if you remember the Christmas message from last year, these shepherds in this field was the shepherds. They were the temple shepherds. They watched over the temple sheep that would eventually be slaughtered and sacrificed as sacrifices at the temple. So that's kind of amazing. Jesus, who's also called the Lamb of God, was 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 born in a shepherd's field, where they you know where they were um, uh, where they were tending the, the the flock for the temple. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them. Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to people he favors. And it's interesting that this, this birth of the king was announced to peasants, announced to the lowest rung of the ladder of occupation in that area in that time. This was a birth of a king. It should have been proclaimed to nobles, but the nobles, the wise men, didn't find out until two years later. They didn't come till two years after the fact or several years after the fact. So we, it goes on to say, when the angels had left them, and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which is the Lord who has made known to us. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured these things in her heart and meditated on them. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that, that they had seen and heard, which was just as he has been told. Now, it says eight days later, when the eighth day was complete for his circumcision. So if he was born on the first day of tabernacles, the last day of tabernacles is day eight, which is Simchat Torah, rejoicing in the Torah, rejoicing in the laws of God, the word of God. Jesus is called the living word. And uh, it's also called uh, um, the, the, just the eighth day. So when the eighth day was complete for his circumcision, he was named Yeshua, Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived. So the name, he was named before Hanukkah. Because he was conceived on Hanukkah. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses was finished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. Huh. Every firstborn male will be Hanukkahed to the Lord. Isn't this amazing how Hanukkah just kind of fits right in here? And, they, and to offer sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. What does this tell us about Mary and Joseph? It tells us that they weren't rich. If you were rich, you would sacrifice a sheep or a goat or something of that nature. A poor man's sacrifice was turtle doves and pigeons. That's all that Mary and Joseph, as humble as they were, could afford. So Jesus, though he was royalty from heaven, was born into poverty. Now here's, here is the amazing thing. We, we go into Simon's prophecy and Anna's testimony and all this kind of stuff. So Yeshua was dedicated or Hanukkah and entered into the 
uh, Abrahamic covenant through circumcision on the eighth day of Sukkot, which is rejoicing in the law. So Yeshua is the living manifestation of the written word, as it says in John. So if you turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What did Jesus say in John 10? I and my Father are one. I am the Messiah. I've told you before, but you won't believe me. And here, this confirms this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. Jesus is the living word. He was, he was that verbal agent that spoke everything into creation. All things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that had been created. So Yeshua is the living manifestation of the written word. And in Psalm 119, which Psalm 119 is all about God's word. It's David just head over heels over God's law. And it says in Psalm 119, 105, the word is a lamp. Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, the word of God is a light and a lamp and so is Yeshua because it continues in John 1 verse 4. In him was life and that life was the light of men. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. And there's, that, there's another connection right there. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness. The darker it is, the winter season, the brighter the light shines. And the darker this world gets, when we shine our lights as believers in Messiah Yeshua, the more brightly we will burn and the more people will see us because we are, we're so different and we're so set apart from the darkness of this world. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Light is always more powerful than darkness. The darkness will never swallow up the light. The light will always expel darkness. So we see that Yeshua is, is the light. He's the living word. And Yeshua is the living representation of the physical tabernacle and the physical temple. Because in John 1.14, it says, The word became flesh and tabernacled, dwelt among us. And we observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we also see in Revelation 21, 22, that Jesus himself, Yeshua himself, is the temple. Now, what else is the temple? Our bodies, that's right, Tracy. Our bodies are the temple because when we get saved, where do we ask Jesus to come into? Our hearts. Our heart is the seat of our emotion. The heart is our throne in which God dwells and rules. It's different for every culture. Some cultures, if you're a missionary and have been on the mission field, some people ask Jesus into their throat. Some people ask Jesus into their bowels. Some people ask Jesus into their liver. And some, Jesus ask, some people ask Jesus into their stomach because each culture has a different seat of where their emotion is. But for us, it's the heart. So when, when we ask Jesus to come into our heart, he sits on the throne of our hearts and he rules and reigns from us, the temple. And Paul talks about how our body is the temple. Our body is not our own. And so Hanukkah means the festival of dedication. So, as believers in Jesus Christ, as believers in Messiah Yeshua, I implore you that during this Hanukkah season, even though you may not put up a menorah, even though you may not light the candles like I do and my family does at our house, you can still take this season and say, okay, Lord, this is the time where, where, where my Savior was conceived. This is the time that we're to be lights of the world. This is the time where the Maccabees retook the temple and cleansed it. Lord, I am your temple. Cleanse me. Purify me. I rededicate my life. I rededicate myself to you because I want you to rule and reign from my heart. And I want you to be glorified in this newly purified temple of my body. So let this season be a Hanukkah season for you as, as Gentile believers in Jesus Christ, Messiah Yeshua. Be Hanukkah. Be dedicated to the Lord. And what a better time to do this right before the time you celebrate and recognize his birth. So Yeshua is our Hanukkah in every way. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, your word is so amazing. So amazingly mind-blowing. We thank you, Lord, for all these prophetic connections. Not only do you connect prophetically through the scripture, but even through Jewish tradition that really, you know, is kind of separated from scripture to, to a certain degree. It just amazes me. Lord, there's, there's, there's no way that, that, that to me that anybody can say that your word is not the words of God. That is not true. All these things are not coincidences. It's too impossible, too statistically, astoundingly impossible to be anything uh, like a coincidence. This is true. This is prophetic. And these things just solidify our faith and our belief in you. Our, our faith and our belief in your word. Our faith and our belief in, in the Messiah and his salvation. We thank you, Lord that this was the time that Yeshua was conceived. And we thank you, Lord, that nine months later, he was born. And I know Christians celebrate it a little early, but they're celebrating the birth of Messiah, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we thank you for this time of year, what it does to our hearts and minds, how it, there's a paradigm shift that happens in our spirit, how, how Lord, you call us back to a simplistic, basic, uh, more deeper relationship with you in some senses. So, Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we glorify you. We thank you for everything you've done for us, everything you've given us. We thank you for this season. And, Lord, you are the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for the season. Hanukkah is all about his conception, and we thank you, and we praise you for that. And we ask and pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. You know, I watched a very interesting documentary. There's a streaming service on the Roku called uh, Tubi. And they have ads and things like that, but you can watch really interesting things. There's a documentary, if you can find it, it's called Crucifixion Quake. And it's very fascinating because in Matthew, it talks about during the crucifixion how there was an earthquake, right? This one geologist says, I want to find that earthquake. Did it really happen or was Matthew just being embellishing here? So he was able to look through the different stratas of soil and was able to find that exact earthquake. Not only that, but it's discovered that during that earthquake, there was also a dust storm that blotted out the sun. That's those three hours of darkness that's talked about in the scripture. And also there was an eclipse during that time as well. And because of those three witnesses, they were able to pinpoint on our Gregorian calendar when Jesus was crucified. That was April 3rd, 33 AD. So, I mean, science and geology is so cool because it, it further proves our faith and per, further proves the scripture. All right, let's sing. <laughs> 